And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house. Hope everyone is doing phenomenal. Today's video is going to be on cortisol and the glutathione connection. This is a really important topic. Glutathione is your master antioxidant. It's a sulfur-rich compound made from cysteine, glutamine, glycine. These are sulfur-rich amino acids. You're going to find these primarily in animal-rich products. Uh, Plant-based products tend to be lower in methionine and lysine. Um, so methionine is a key sulfur amino as well. So you tend to have less sulfur aminos in plant-based products. So glutathione, really important. Vegans, vegetarians are going to have a lower amount of it unless you're supplementing additional amino acids, whether it's from plant or rice. So you're getting a higher amount. But it's hard to get enough amino acids when you're dealing with plants. Typically plants, protein, when you combine them, it's got like a 25 to 30% protein, 70% carbs. So you have a lot of carbohydrate in a lot of these plant proteins. So animal protein doesn't have all the carbs. It has a lot of good fats with it as well. And very satiating. doesn't put your blood sugar on a roller coaster. So number one, glutathione, how do we make it? Amino acids, sulfur-rich animal proteins are going to be your best sources. Obviously, we have supplemental liposomal glutathione the best or reduced glutathione because glutathione is very poorly absorbed. So either a reduced form or a liposomal form where it's in a phosphatidylcholine carrier so it's easily absorbed. Glutathione outside of those things isn't absorbed well. Now, we can also give the n acetylcysteine or the cysteine, the glutamine, the glycine, which really help bump up intercellular glutathione stores. And of course, we can give things like selenium and vitamin C, which are also important cofactors for glutathione as well. Glutathione is your master antioxidant. So when we have oxidative stress, which is essentially a loss of electrons, when you lose electrons, that's where oxidation comes in. And then you start to have free radical damage where your DNA is being chipped away at. So oxidation is a loss of electron reduction is a gain. So back in biochem, we remembered it by the saying oil rig. Oxidation is loss reduction is a gain. So even though you think reduction, well, you're actually gaining an electron. It's kind of a counterintuitive thing. You need these kind of mnemonic devices to stay on top of it. So sulfur amino acids, really important. Oxidative stress. What's oxidative stress? You're losing electrons. Glutathione is the massive electron donor, and it really helps stabilize um, all these oxidative stressors, and it helps upregulate phase two pathways, which are really important for expelling toxins out of the body. Now, the next connection is cortisol. Why is cortisol and glutathione so important? Because cortisol is your major stress hormone. It's gonna go up in fight or flight stress responses. It's gonna go up when your blood sugar is going wonky. It's gonna go up when you're not getting enough nutrition or lack of sleep. Cortisol is catabolic, meaning it's gonna break down primarily tissue and or protein and amino acids uh, to make glucose to help fuel that stress response. So why is this important? Because the amino acids that make glutathione, well, they can be catabolized too. And there's some data showing that increased stress, increased cortisol, we see a, a decrease in intercellular glutathione level. So really, really important. Cortisol's up. We have a really good chance overall to be decreasing our antioxidant, especially glutathione. So what does that mean in the toxic world that we live in, right? Is our world more toxic or less over the last generation, decade or so? Well, more pesticides, over 2 billion pounds a year, uh, more heavy metals, uh, but definitely the pesticides with conventional farming is huge. So if we have more toxic load on our body and we also have a stress gone up the last 100 years or not, right? It's gone up. So we have more stress, which equals more cortisol, which is going to do what to intercellular glutathione levels? What's it going to do? It's going to drop it. So high stress, more toxins, lower glutathione, and this is going to put more carcinogenic compounds and more oxidative stress on our body and then we have cancer and disease and all kinds of symptoms that patients come to me to kind of help manage and get them back on track so I want people to be able to think deeper into the stress hormone connection why it affects uh, our body's ability to expel toxins to neutralize free radicals and to help with that oxidative stress because they're all connected so we have the food with all the nutrition coming in, and then we have all of the, the digestion of these nutrients, and then these nutrients help go to work. So the more stressed we are, it's actually really, really important that we have more um, nutrients on board to help deal with these toxicities. Now, one study that just came by my desk today, it's an older study, but it was really interesting. It was a study where they looked at a whole bunch of skiers, I think like, Athletic skiers, I'm not sure if it was cross country or not, 
but there was one thing they were talking about. They were looking at cell damage and antioxidant status and cortisol levels related to ski mountaineering during a two-day race. One thing they saw was cortisol was correlated. It was negatively correlated. So meaning cortisol goes up, these things go down, right? Correlation means this goes up, this goes up, right? right? But when it's negatively correlated, this goes up, this is going the opposite direction. But they found that cortisol was correlated with low um, energy, like low protein levels, low fat intake, low a vitamin A, B1, B2, B6. Um, so it, it was correlated in a negative fashion with all these intercellular nutrients. So if we're not getting enough nutrition in our body, we're eating a standard American diet, guess what? We're going to be potentially causing cortisol increases because of these important vitamins and minerals, uh, also sodium, zinc, and iron as well. So really, really important when we're putting ourselves under oxidative stress. And there's physical oxidative stress, but there's also mental, emotional oxidative stress. So the more stress we are in our life, whether it's food or work or friends or family or sleep, that's also going to put cortisol out of balance. And then of course, over time, cortisol can get depleted as well. And then we don't have much of a cortisol response. And then we are kind of in the dumps. We're, we're anxious. We're moody. We have really terrible energy. And then that comes on the flip side. So hope that helps. I'm going to open it up for a live Q and A here. I hope that was very helpful. If you guys are enjoying this, smash that like button right now, put your comments down below, give me your thoughts and give me a share. I really appreciate it. All right, let's dive in. Thank you, Sonia. appreciate it. Tammy writes in, I find adaptogens too stimulating and B-complex causes migraines, other adrenals, cortisol, support for adrenal fatigue, um, for flatline cortisol. So first thing is you would look at doing adaptogens at lower doses and do single source adaptogens. So I would look at something less stimulating, maybe like an ashwagandha or a holy basil. You could even do something like a, a cordyceps mushroom. And then I would look at doing something maybe just a, a lower dose vitamin C. And then you can even do some of the B vitamins um, at, a, at a lower dose or more individual. So you could do a B5 is really important for the adrenals. You could do B5 by itself. You could do B12 drops by themselves. So just start with things one at a time and see how you do. Ashwagandha, holy basil are good adaptogens to start with. All right, excellence. All right, I'm not finding a good result from l and alanine, wondering if I should do tryptophan instead. So what's the goal? l alanine converts to tyrosine. Tyrosine converts to um, dopamine and then, of course, adrenaline and dopamine. So the better converter is going to be tyrosine. So if you're looking for it to have a bump in your dopamine and slash adrenaline stress levels, go to tyrosine instead. Mm. Can adrenal adaptogens cause you to go into adrenal insufficiency? No, because they aren't that stimul they aren't that stimulating. So the big thing that's gonna create more adrenal insufficiency is like a stimulant more like a methamphetamine or a stimulant medication. You have a greater chance with like cocaine or adalin or ritalin or some kind of methamphetamine to do that. Would it drive it into total insufficiency? I don't know. A lot of the, the total insufficiency cases are more autoimmune as well. So I'm not sure about that. Hold on, my cat's trying to get back in here. Come on, Dexter. Come on in. Good boy. All right. Dr. J, I have a pituitary adenoma, all hormones low and pretty symptomatic. Would you advise surgery or a typical BHRT health bioidentical hormone related therapy? Health lifestyle is enough. So is it benign? That's the question. If it's a benign tumor, then you, I think you have a lot of options. If it's cancerous, you really got to look at reviewing all your options. So um, ketogenic diet for sure is going to be one of the first things that I'm going to do 100%. I'm going to get a couple of referrals to some really good neurosurgeons, figure out if it's benign, and I'm going to be doing a full ketogenic diet. I may look at adding high-dose enzyme therapy in there and um, high-dose enzymes, enzymes taken away from food. You can just Google Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez enzyme therapy. And I'd also look at some, some CBD and some medicinal mushrooms as well. But look at the ketogenic diet do some sauna therapy and really work on cleaning out your diet and lean more to a good keto side, but get some more information from your neurosurgeon first. Hopefully it's benign. All right, Ashley writes in, does chronically high cortisol lower all female hormones uh, and explain perimenopause? So 
Essentially, high cortisol will deplete a lot of your female hormones, especially progesterone for sure, but more than likely estrogen and everything else will start to come kind of, will start to drop as well. Now, a lot of perimen, most women, they, if they're healthy, perimenopause happens just a few years away from menopause. It's like you start to lose your cycle, or you start to have some menopausal symptoms like hot flashes and mood issues, and that starts to signal that menopause is coming close. The problem is I see so many cycling women, meaning in their 20s and 30s, having all these menopausal symptoms, or I should say, having all these perimenopausal symptoms, but they kind of fit into the PMS category. So because women's hormones are going so out of balance, the PMS symptoms and perimenopausal symptoms can kind of overlap. I mean, I guess some of the things that you wouldn't see, maybe hot flashes, those kind of things, but with hormones going out of balance, a lot of these PMS symptoms can overlap, but the healthier you are, the closer that per those perimenopausal symptoms occur with actual menopause, late 40s, early 50s. But I'm seeing women go into their even menopausal in their mid to late 30s now, just because their hormones are so depleted and there's lots of estrogen mimickers in the environment. And then of course, then you have things like estrogen dominance, driving fibroids, and endometriosis, which could potentially you know, cause um, hysterectomy. Jamie, you are welcome. Uh, would a pituitary tumor show up on a CT brain scan with no contrast? Uh, I'm not sure the gold standard on that. I'm pretty sure you would need to do an MRI for that one, but either MRI or gold standard on that one, your best bet would be to um, consult with the neurosurgeon on that or a radiologist, but I think MRI is going to probably be your gold standard there. Sue writes in, I wish there was a way to get past the sulfur sensitivity so I could take glutathione. So, I mean, easy thing I would look at first is you could start with something simple like whey protein and start there. Uh, you could just really work on eating good sulfur-rich meats. If you're really having a lot of problems with sulfur, I would look at potential SIBO or gut issues or dysbiosis and start there and then kind of work your way up and just focus on some good whole food sources and see how you do. Uh, Monica writes, and do coffee enemas really boost glutathione levels? Yes, coffee enemas do. I like coffee enemas because it really rings out your liver. It causes a whole bunch of toxins to be dumped out. It really stimulates glutathione. It's not a substitute in and of itself. So if you had cancer, you'd want to be doing glutathione nutritional support, but you'd, you'd use the coffee enema as a great way to physically detoxify your body. And ideally combining it with um, infrared sauna is going to be great too. That's great. Uh, what if you are a veterinarian as I only eat eggs? I think you mean a vegetarian. Veterinarian who deals with the animals. Uh, only eat eggs and the occasional salmon. That's still really good. If you're only eating eggs and you're getting good egg yolks in and you're still eating some good fish, you're still fine. You're gonna be you're gonna be okay as long as you're getting, you know, one to two servings of those per day. You're gonna be fine. Maybe supplement some additional pea protein or collagen amino acids. I don't see a problem with that. It's really the vegans that aren't getting any of that. I mean, if you're getting like two or three egg yolks a day, I mean, just the amount of choline and good essential fatty acids, um, you are totally in great shape. Uh, I would I would recommend some grass-fed beet, though, if you could slip it in there every now and then. That would help. Can I take glutathione with MCT oil and make it more bioavailable? Yep, that's fine. I have no problem with it. Are eggs sustainable for glutathione? I think it's glutathione, you mean. Um, eggs are great, very sulfur-rich. They're going to be very helpful as a precursor to the sulfur aminos you need for glutathione. That's correct. Is NAC enough, or is it necessary to do an actual glutathione supplement? It depends. NAC is pretty good. If your health is okay, NAC is pretty good. If you really want to be more therapeutic or you're having a more toxic load or you're more sick, you may want to add in the glutathione, but NAC starting out is still really good. Lisa, you are welcome. Monica, what's the best way to measure glutathione levels? Um, you can run a spectra cell test. That's helpful. I think Doctor's Data runs an intercellular glutathione test as well. And then on the organic acids, you can look at pyroglutamate and sulfate and alpha hydroxybutyrate and 2-phenylacetic acid, I think. Those are the big ones. Why do I wake up every three to four hours so hungry? I eat protein, grass-fed beef, pasture eggs. I'm taking aminos, B12, benfotamine. You may want to look at adding carbohydrates. It sounds like you have some severe adrenal issues. There could be some poor digestion problems, so you may not be able to be digesting a lot of those nutrients. I look at getting your adrenals tested, getting your gut looked at, and then playing around with carbs as well, and then just... Try to be eating every three hours while you work on things. 
what is a natural way to lower prostaglandin release that happens with PMS? I don't want to take ibuprofen. Yeah, so the best way to lower prostaglandins that are associated with PMS is going to be black currant seed oil. That helps lower and modulate prostaglandins, um, the, the, the one and three pathways. Also, you can do cramp bark extract, which is really good too, especially if there's cramping pain. Wanda writes in, my mom has heart disease and she only has... Uh, she only has one artery left with blood flow. How can I help her? She's been getting more and more tired. I can see her declining. I think she'd benefit from keto. Yeah, keto would be great. A kind of a, a lower carb pay, a keto or a lower carb paleo template or a keto template. They're kind of the same thing. Big thing you'd want to do is really increase carnitine, really increase CoQ10, ribose, B vitamins, vitamin C, all of the um, mitochondrial supporting, beta oxidation supporting, uh, energizing nutrients. That heart's a muscle that's just literally, it's doing this all day long. I mean, just take your hand like this and just keep on doing it. See how tired you get within an hour, right? That's your heart all the time. So you need lots of CoQ10, lots of B vitamins, carnitine, creatine, ribose, really good, mito lots of vitamin E, right? So you really got to get those nutrients dialed in along with supplements. And then you can look at Reach out to Dr. Jack Wilson. He'll be helpful. But there's like calcium EDTA therapy, which can be helpful with some blockages. You can do systemic enzymes taken away from food. You'd want to do those therapies under the guidance of a trained functional medicine practitioner. But the diet strategies can be started. And I'd recommend testing her intercellular nutrient levels so you know what's there specifically. And then you can target things on top of just the, the clinical foundations, right? Hey, Rona, hope you're doing well. Rona writes in. Um, why would one take it? Why would one take it if sensitive to sulfur? Well, it depends. If you're sensitive to sulfur, there's other things going on. Yep, I already mentioned it. There could be some gut stuff going on, but work on just trying to get most of your sulfur from whole foods. Again, vegetables are going to have some good sulfur as well. It won't have a high amount of amino acids. Like people are like, oh, you can get like, you know, your kale is like 20% protein or like, you know, it's got all this high percent of protein. It's like, yeah, but it's got like 15 calories or 20 calories. So yeah, okay, it's got like five calories or three calories of protein, right? Someone told me, oh, what was it? They're like, um, they said, oh, kale's super nutrient dense. And they were comparing some of the vitamins and minerals in kale. And I did the math on it. I went to the, I think it was the USDA database. And I compared the amount of nutrition in kale to equal eight ounces of grass-fed beef. Eight ounces of grass-fed beef, it literally took protein-wise, I think it was protein, it took 15 cups, 15 servings of kale. It's like, oh my gosh, like no one's going to be able to eat 15 servings. Almost anyone can sit down and have eight ounces, most people, right? Smaller person, maybe not, but definitely in two meals, there's no way anyone's having 15, 16 servings of kale in two meals, maybe even in two days. That's hard, right? All right, Rashawn writes in, naturopath put me on a high-dose ashwagandha adapogen for a UTI infection. I ended up with very low stomach acid. I sense a thyroid disruption due to tightness in the air. Any thoughts? Oof, I mean, I need a more specific question than that, but I love ashwagandha. It's not what I would use for UTI issues. I use D-Manos. I use Uva Ursi. I use Golden Seal. I use Silver for those things. But I love ashwagandha. My, my dose is uh, one to two grams a day or 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams, same thing. Nutri eval showed low amino acids, but I eat plenty of protein, thinking it's an assimilation issue. What enzyme and HCL supplement do you recommend? Um, well, my line I use betaine HCL Supreme and the Enzyme Synergy. Love those. Um, utilize those for digestion. Calibrate the HCL and then test your gut. Make sure there's no infections or bacterial overgrowth or parasites. And also make sure you're not overly stressed because, like I said, cortisol will catabolize some of those amino acids too. Didi writes in, what's the relation with a, between a flatline, metabolized cortisol, and almost non-existent ferritin? Well, you're, you're going to have really, it's going to be hard to have good adrenal health and good, good mitochondrial health if your ferritin is low because you need ferritin to carry oxygen. If you can't carry oxygen, you're going to have very anemic, small red blood cells. You're going to have no oxygen carrying capacity. You need oxygen for your beta oxidation and for your mitochondria to work. And if your mitochondria doesn't work, your adrenals aren't going to work well because you need oxygen, you need blood flow, nutrition for your adrenals to work. So anemia is a deal breaker. If you have an anemia, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. That includes thyroid, adrenals, female hormones. So if there's anemia, you got to fix it, 
got to get to the root cause. And women, most of the time, if they're vegan, vegetarian, that's the first one. Number two, the second one's going to be estrogen dominance, causing a lot of excess of uh, bleeding or menstruation at that time of the month. And then the next one will be severe malabsorption. So any gut issues, severe bleeding, all sort of colitis, just poor digestion, that could be part of it. Ashley wrote in, thank you for answering all my questions. Looking forward to our appointment Friday. I'll send you a set of labs. Awesome. Well, great. I look forward to connecting with you, Ashley. I'm glad that you value all the information and you appreciate it. I look forward to connecting with you soon. All right, guys. Hope everyone is doing really, really well. I'm going to go take my son out for a walk. Hope you guys have a great next rest of your day. And I will be back tomorrow if I have time. If not, definitely Friday morning. Hope you all have a phenomenal day. Comments below, thumbs up, smash the like button. Take care, y'all. Bye now.